Uh, this is a lecture for my first hour class on the second day of May. But at a White House press dinner, uh, they had a female reporter, and that was really rare in those days. Not today, but they had a, a, a female reporter, and she was she was standing. Thank you. She was standing at the back of the room before the banquet started. She was standing at the back of the room before the banquet started, and she had the had been invited to sit at the head table with the president. That's that's a big deal. Sit at the head table, and of course, all these male reporters were back there. They were jealous. And she was talking to him before the uh, banquet began. And one of them said to her, well, it doesn't make any difference. And you'll sit there by him a couple of hours and said, you won't get two words. He won't say two words. You won't get two words out of him. And she said, I bet you 10 bucks I will. And so they all took the bet, 10 bucks, that she could get Calvin Coolidge during this hour and a half long banquet to say more than two words. So the banquet starts, and she takes her seat beside the president, and they're sitting there, and Coolidge is just looking like that, just looking straight ahead. And uh, she's turned to him and said, Mr. President. She looks and said, Mr. President. And he acknowledges her, looks at, looks at uh, her, and she says, you see those men sitting back there in that corner? And Coolidge looked and looked back at her, and she said, before the banquet started, they, I bet each one of those men $10 that I could get more than two words out of you tonight. And Coolidge looked at her and said, you lose, and didn't say anything else for the rest of the evening, okay? You lose. She lost her 10 bucks. He was silent as a cake of ice. Uh, his marriage proposal to his wife was this, Grace Coolidge, and I'll show you a picture of her, and I think she was the most attractive first lady uh, since Dolly Madison, okay? Uh, she's one of our more attractive first ladies. And um, here's how he proposed to her. You know, if you watch the Hallmark Channel and your vision of life is all this gush and sad music, uh, he looked at her and he said, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> and they got married and stayed married. And I guess they were happily married. Uh, he was, uh, he probably slept more than any president. He got up about eight o'clock every morning and he would have breakfast. And by 10 o'clock, he was in the presidential office. And uh, he didn't even have a phone on his desk, okay? He didn't even have a phone. I guess he didn't want to be disturbed. Uh, when he went to a restaurant by himself to eat, he would uh, get a corner table and he would sit with his back to the rest of the people when he ate. Uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, you know, would uh, have a couple of appointments. And then at noon, he would go back to the residence in the White House and eat with Mrs. Coolidge. And then about uh, one, he would go back to the presidential office and he would have a couple of appointments. And at three o'clock, he would pull down all the shades in the Oval Office and pull out the bottom uh, drawer of his desk and prop his feet up in it and lean back in his chair and he'd take a nap. And then he would get up and he would have a couple of more appointments. And about four o'clock, he would exercise. Coolidge exercise, you know. Presidents all have their different way of exercising. George Bush rode, I'm talking about George W. Bush, he rode bicycles till he fell off and almost killed himself. What did Obama do for exercise? He had to put a basketball court out in the Rose Garden so he could just, you know, yank his tie off and dash out there and shoot a few baskets and go back to, I guess, deciding world events. Um, Eisenhower played golf. The U.S. Golf Association put a little miniature putt-putt golf course so when he was president outside the Oval Office so he could dash out of there and putt the ball around. So they all, uh, they all have their FDR, even though he was paralyzed, he swam. Still, his pool is in the White House. He had that pool built, he swam. So they all have their exercise. Coolidge rode horses, okay? But the problem was is he was allergic to horses and couldn't stand them. I mean, if he got from here to that door to a horse, his eyes would swell shut and he would start sneezing and his nose would trickle. There's Grace Coolidge, okay? Um. Uh, there she is. I'll come back to that. But he had the army make him do what? Yeah, I'm going to get back. That's Rebecca, the raccoon. Uh, but uh, they're, the coolers, they were real animal lovers. Uh, they had six dogs in the White House. And they had parrots flying up and down the hallways. And they had raccoons. And, you know, coolers, if a possum would have showed up, he'd let that. But that's his horse. That's his mechanical horse. And he named it Thunderbolt. 
And so when he was president, you might be driving by the way. And they set that outside his office and, you know, you might pass by. It's kind of like, you know, the little kitty things they used to have. You drop a nickel or a dime or 25 or whatever it is. And it would be, well, that's kind of what, that, that's how, that's the only exercise uh, he ever got. Uh, well, let's go back here. Here's, um, like I say, there's Mrs. Coolidge with one of the six dogs. That's the raccoon, Rebecca, okay? Look how big that raccoon is. It's sitting in her lap, and it goes all the way to her chin. That raccoon's that big. It's huge. And you notice they had a chain on it. They let that raccoon pretty well run throughout the White House. But every year, starting with Grover Cleveland, the first lady has a Easter egg. They call it Easter egg roll. It's an Easter egg hunt for all the D.C. children. You can kind of see how children dressed in the 1920s. And Mrs. Coolidge did that. And so I guess she had brought Rebecca out, but you always have got her on a chain because, you know, uh, Rebecca was sort of an ornery old cuss. And uh, she might have crawled out of her lap and mauled one of those kids. So they had it on a chain. Uh, on one occasion, Coolidge was talking to someone. You know, if you know anything about raccoons, they attracted anything shiny. I had some neighbors one time that rescued a little raccoon about that big and raised it to this huge raccoon. And you would go over there and it would swat, literally crawl, you know, just walk. You know, they never sit still, you know, those raccoons in the house. They uh, will walk over tables and they'll knock over everything and they'll hop up on the back of your chair. And that coon used to swat the back of my bald head. It likes anything shiny. That's no joke. That's the, that thing actually would swat the back of my head. Well, that coon did that to the French ambassador or some official in there. He just jumped up on the back of the chair and just started swatting him in the back of the head and Coolidge had to call someone to take Rebecca out. Like I say, <coughs> they had dogs, they had dogs all over the place. I see here six dogs, four <coughs> cats, birds, and the raccoon, the raccoon uh, Rebecca. Okay. Uh, there's Coolidge with one of the dogs. And there's the Coolidge family. And they had a tragedy while Coolidge was in the White House. That uh, was his oldest son, Cal Jr. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure Calvin Coolidge loved his whole family, but he really set a lot of stock in Cal Jr. And apparently Cal Jr. was pretty bright. Uh, but he went out and played, when he was 16, he went out and he played tennis one day on the White House tennis courts. And he rubbed the blister on his foot. And you've all done that. You've all been working or jogging or playing in a game. And you rub a blister on your foot, you usually just pop it and, you know, put something on it, triple antibiotic ointment and go on. But you know, as I often say to students, you don't know how lucky you are that you are living in the age of antibiotics. If, if you weren't, probably six or eight of you'd be dead by now. Uh, and he got that, and he popped the blister and cleaned it up, but it became infected, and he got a blood infection, and he died while Coolidge was in the White House. Okay, and Coolidge never, for some reason, he never forgave himself for that. He said, if I had not pursued the presidency, this probably probably wouldn't happen. So the Coolidges, like I say, they did su suffer that tragedy while they were in the White House. Well, so what was Coolidge all about? Get this down. He's the most conservative president. Coolidge is the most conservative president of the 1920s. And by the way, I think you already have this down, but he is the president for most of the 1920s. Look, Coolidge's presidency, you got this all down, you know, I mean, look, progressivism, those, if there were any doubts about progressivism being done, uh, it's done with Coolidge. Because this is a Coolidge is a return, get this down, to rugged individualism. To rugged individualism. His idea, listen, his idea is, hey, don't, get this down, don't look for government to help you. As Bill Gates told the graduating class a few years ago of these bright young things, he said, here's my advice to you. Pull up your pants and get a job if you want to make it in life. Pull up your pants and get a job. Well, Coolidge could have said that. All this stuff about uplift your fellow man, help the poor, all of that. Coolidge said his attitude was you live in this big, dumb, prosperous country. The economy is doing better than ever before. Make it on your own. Work hard, obey the law, and don't look for anybody to uplift you. Uplift yourself. Also, get this down. He believed in small government. He didn't want the government. He, he wanted to cut back on the side, and he did it. He also cut taxes. And he also believed in leaving, get all this out, he also believed in leaving business alone. He said, let business prosper. Let business prosper. The better business does, the better America does. And get this quote down by Coolidge. He actually said, 
you'll see this on your next multiple choice and completion test. Coolidge said, the business of America is business. He said, we're all for business. Business creates jobs. Business increases national wealth. Anything I can do to support big business, I'm going, I'm going to do it. And so he essentially got all this down. He essentially left things alone. He put the government on automatic pilot and the economy just boomed. He didn't interfere. Coolidge's presidency is called the dollar decade. <coughs> it worked. It worked. He doesn't make a lot of speeches. Every time you turn, I don't care which president you're talking about. Every time you turn, turn around, the president's on television making some statement about something. Or on Twitter. Is that what they do on Twitter? Um, Coolidge didn't. He just sort of minded the store, kept things running, didn't have a lot of new ideas, and uh, got this down about Coolidge, too. He's the right, you know, he has this uncanny knack. If you read a biography of Coolidge, and I have, he's one of my favorite presidents, not a very good president, but one of my favorites. I just think he's an interesting character. But if you read a biography of Coolidge, you'll see that in his entire life, he was lucky. He, 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 he always managed to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, and the same was true with his presidency. The same was true with his presidency. Uh, the economy is going to boom, and he had very little to do with that. He had very little to do with that. But he gets credit for it. And he's one of our most popular presidents. How many, how many of you have ever heard of Calvin Coolidge before you came in here? Yeah. Well, in 1920, he was, you know, rated as one of our most powerful, uh, pre not, not powerful, but one of our favorite presidents. Um, one of our most popular presidents. In fact, get this down. In 1924, Coolidge was elected by, re-elected by, or he was elected by a landslide. There he is. And that's his campaign one of his campaign uh, posters right there. Keep cool with Coolidge. Keep cool with Coolidge. We got the right man in place. Let's keep him there. And again, the Democrats didn't have a chance, and Coolidge was reelected in 1924. This next presidential election we have will be the 100th anniversary of that. So what did he contribute? If he just happened to be the right guy in the right place, and he was, so far as the economy was concerned, what did he contribute? I want you to write this down. His greatest contribution. And this is important. And this is why I really like him. His greatest contribution was is that after the Harding administration, get this down, after the Harding administration, when a good number of the American people were saying, oh, they're all a bunch of crooks. And you should never say that because it's never true. You know, that's just the, that's the biggest cop out of the world. I'm not going to vote because they're all a bunch. Well, that's just not true. Never has been. I suspect it never will be. But Sometimes things happen. Watergate with Richard Nixon in the 1970s. A lot of people lost faith in government and didn't participate. A lot of people lost faith. A lot of people lost faith with, uh, in government because of Richard Nixon. Well, the greatest contribution, the greatest contribution of Calvin Coolidge is that he, through his, not, not through any law he passed, but through his personal conduct in office, he didn't cheat on his wife. He didn't break the prohibition laws. Uh, he didn't have crooks in his cabinet. Uh, through, his, through his personal conduct, he restored the faith of the American people in their government. And people having faith in their government is a really, really important thing. Calvin Coolidge was a serious, sober family man. He was absolutely honest. You might question his policies, but you could never question his character his personal character. But, and, and that, that's his most important contribution, but the economy did boom and he got credit for that. Um, so, uh, also got this down too. This is a not necessarily a good thing. <coughs> During the, the Coolidge administration, credit buying, buying on credit, credit buying became pretty much acceptable in American society and it, is going on to this day. You know, up until Coolidge, and I, again, I'm speaking in broad general terms, <coughs> up until Calvin Coolidge, you know, if you wanted a house, you just saved until you had enough money to buy it. There's no such thing as I'm going to go borrow the money. To, you know, you just save, and if you never saved enough, you just never had a house. Same way with a car, same way with anything else you wanted. You just paid cash. People didn't go into it. Oh, you might have a little bill down at the general store, 
you might some, send somebody down there to get a nickel loaf of bread. And the mom would say, we'll just have them put the nickel on credit and tell them we're going to be paid on Friday and I'll come to town Saturday and I'll settle our bill. Little things like that. But people didn't buy major items on credit. Get this down. During the Coolidge administration, that changes. <coughs> and it's not necessarily Coolidge's fault. It's just how prosperous the economy was. Got this down. People are, people were encouraged. People were encouraged to buy on credit. To buy, 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 buy. You know, it's the consumer class. Get this down. The great American and all of you are consumers. All of us are consumers. Probably all of us have bought something this morning. Uh, but on our way to school before the day has even started. The great consumer class. You're a consumer. A consumer is someone who goes to McDonald's and orders a Big Mac. You're a consumer. Uh, the problem with this is, is that by 1929, get this down, the problem with this is, is that by 1929, the year the Great Depression hits, is that a lot of people were in debt up to their eyeballs. They owed for their house. They owed for their car. They owed for everything. And when the Depression came and millions and millions of Americans lost their jobs, what happened to all those things that they owed for? What happens to your house if you can't pay? Huh? Then the bank comes and takes it. The bank comes and takes the car. We loan you $265 to buy that Model T. You still owe us $140. Can you, no, I can't pay. I'm sorry, I lost my job. You know, there's this impression thing going, they took your car. They took your house. That's why there were people out living under bridges during the Great Depression. Uh, they were homeless uh, because uh, they had bought all of these things in the 20s when times were good on credit. So uh, you have the rise of the consumer class uh, and, of course, an unforeseen uh, uh, result of that. Nobody could have seen this coming, really, but an unforeseen result uh, 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 the result of that is that the people really suffer uh, when the Great Depression, the Great Depression comes. I also want you to write this down, too, about the 1920s, Coolidge and the 20s. The heroes of the 1920s were not the movie stars. Have we talked about the movie stars? We talk, Well, we will. Uh, and not the athletes. Uh, we will we'll talk about those. I mean, in many ways, the 1920s is the golden age of sports. In fact, you know, there's such a creature called a sports historian. You know, there are all sorts of historians, economic historians, military historians, and there are sports historians. And most sports historians, I think, say that, that the greatest team, the greatest team in the history of baseball, for instance, and I'll show you a picture of them, uh, was the 1927 New York Yankees. Now, you know I'm a Yankee partisan. I'm not saying that as a partisan, but um, that's what they agree on. So um, many people say that that, the 20s was the golden age of sports. And we'll talk about all those athletes in the 1920s. But uh, they weren't the great heroes. Get this down. The great heroes uh, in America, and I'm talking about the, the people that people looked up to, were businessmen. This is the age of big business, the businessmen. And can you name me any businessman that you think that they admired? You know, I mean, who, who I mean, this is true to this day. Uh, Bill Gates. If Bill Gates was giving a lecture over here in the auditorium, or down foot, this place would be crammed full because people would just like to look at someone. That, that, some money impresses some people. Money impresses them. Uh, you can buy and sell people, most people, for seventy-five dollars because money impresses them. You know? And if Bill Gates was up on a stage, man, you know, the owner of sixty or sixty-eight or seventy billion dollars, how much you people would just go to look at somebody like that? One of the reasons Donald Trump was elected president is that he was a multi-billionaire. People say, well, gee, if he can run his business that good, he ought to be able to do great in government. Well, maybe he did great in government. I guess that's a, a matter of opinion. But the, the point is, is that government is not government is not a business. You know, they're not up in Washington, D.C. making widgets or Toyota automobiles. Government deals with the lives of human beings. Um, personally, I would never vote for a businessman. Never vote for a businessman be a governor or a president. That's just my personal opinion, but I never would do it. But some people believe that. If you can run a business, you can run government. Well, maybe you can, but that ain't necessarily so. Anyhow, um, anyway, uh, businessmen, which business, this is this Elon Musk, you know, and he, he was on all the Sunday talk shows, or they were talking about him. 
Uh, what's he just done? He's buying Twitter. Is that right? Yeah. Boy, that's a national crisis. Uh, too much is made of Twitter. The vast majority of American people aren't even on it. It's a fact. About 30%. And, and you would swear uh, the Russians had invaded Durant the way they were carrying on about it. But anyway, who do you think the great businessman of the 1920s that people admired was? Can you think of any businessmen of the 1920s? Well, there he is. Write him down. Henry Ford. Henry Ford. Uh, he gave people cars and made millions. Today it would be billions in doing it, but that's why they admired him. People said Henry Ford is our friend. He's given us the automobile. Uh, he was a great American success story. Uh, he was the son of Irish immigrants who came here fleeing the potato famine in the 1840s. And I always remember this. You won't, but always remember this. Henry Ford didn't invent the car. That's what they teach you in grade school. It's wrong. They probably let you draw Henry Ford in a car, but Henry Ford did not invent the automobile. Get this down. He invented an automobile that people could afford. There were automobiles before Henry Ford. He invented one. He invented one uh, that you could afford. He invented one that you, and, and the most famous car, get this down, the most famous car that he ever put on, on the road, uh, Ford, his descendants still own Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company is alive and well. They're making electric cars now. Toyota's making electric cars. Um, I saw one, Hyundai, 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 they're announcing their new electric car. Uh, so the electric car is the thing of the future. And I don't mean the distant future. <clears throat> I think it's going to come quicker. And I say good for it. It's going to come quicker than a lot of people think. But, about, you know, the Ford family is still in the car. His descendants are still making millions. They're still in the car business. Um, but he, he uh, the most famous car he ever made was not that, Stutz Bearcat. You don't have to worry about getting run down by that. It was too expensive for people to afford. Uh, but right there, the Model T, write that down. That's, that's the 20s Model T. And there are a lot of those still around, over 100 years old. I was driving down here to Eufaula through all that construction not long ago, a few weeks ago, and 12 of those in a row came by. They were going to some sort of Model T convention, and they were just, they were in that good shape. They had been completely restored. Beautiful cars. Let me show you real quick the great cars of American history. That's one of them. Okay, you don't have to write this down. That's one of them. There's the second great car in American history. That's 57 Chevy. My brother had one of those. It's black where that red is. Great car. 65 Mustang. That's a great car. It's classic. It's classic. These Mustangs they're making today, they're not classics. They're cheap imitations. That's the great car. 69 Roadrunner. Good car. Great car. And that is not. Okay, but that's the latest thing. So you've just I've just walked you through a hundred years of the automobile industry in about thirty seconds. But those are all the great cars. Model T. <coughs> uh, got this down. Um, <clears throat> they called it the Ten Lizzie. They called it a flipper. You had to crank it. I'm going to show you a little thing here in a minute. A little film about that, but they of an actual Ford Motor Company in the 1920s producing Model Ts. But you had to have a crank on it. You turn the key on and set a thing on the dash. I've actually ridden in a Model T, and you would pop that, and and when it took off, the whole thing would just sort of shake and then start running. And that's why they called it a flipper. Yeah. You gotta like get your hand out the way after you. Really it was there a different way. Don't you gotta like get your hand out of the way after you crank it too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, almost everybody. Well, I won't say, it, but but many many people who drove a Model T because that thing had a nasty habit. You know, you know, we're just turning it. I've seen them start it. It wasn't just started like that. And you'll see one in this little film started. But that thing had a nasty habit. You popped it into place, but it had this habit though of kicking back and breaking your wrist or your arm. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, uh, you know, you had to you had to kind of have some practice to know what you were doing. What do you think that Henry Ford sold his first Model T for? Let's get that god awful looking thing off there. 
There's some, there's some farm boys in an old Model T driving around. What, what do you think it costs? $20. Well, that's an educated guess. That's not it. The first one sold for $825 each. You say, well, that's not much money. Well, if you were working in a factory in the 1920s, you were making about 500 bucks a year. Uh, that was, uh, you know, two years, two, at least two years salary, okay, that it cost you. So that was pretty expensive. But he sold so many. It's kind of like the computers. I was telling the class the other day, I remember when the first computers, PCs, came out. And there would be one person on the faculty that mortgaged their house and went and bought one for two or three, I think two or three thousand dollars. And this was back in the early 80s. And of course, with the rest of and they didn't even have Internet. They had a computer with no Internet. Uh, but we and the rest of us had to sit in the lounge and listen to this one person tell us all of his exploits on his computer that weekend. He was pretty proud of it. What can you buy a computer for today? What can you go to Walmart and buy a computer for, do you think? 150. Yeah, or 200 bucks. You know you know why? Because they've sold so many. Uh, the price has actually dropped. Well, that's what happened to the Model T. It started out at $825 a year, but by the middle of the 20s, 1925, you could buy that same car for 265 bucks, which you were pretty close 265 bucks. Okay. Uh, America loved this car. Uh, it was simple construction. You know, there's some people getting to the T uh, simple construction. You could almost fix it with spit and bubble gum and hairpins and bailing wire. They could actually, there were four bolts that held the engine in. There were two bolts that connected the, the transmission to the engine, take off those two bolts, drop the transmission bar then unscrew those four bolts on the engine and you could take literally take the engine out and set it beside the car and hook it to your water well and it would irrigate your fields. Or you could hook it to a crosscut saw and it would cut your wood. And then when you got ready to go to town, set it back in, tighten those bolts, put the transmission, two bolts on the transmission and take off, take off and go, go to town. Um, by 1921, <coughs> He sold a, in 1921, excuse me, he sold a million. And from 1908 to 1927, he sold 15 million. To show you what the demand was, just think about this, to show you what the demand was, uh, by 1927, there was a Model T rolling off the assembly line every 10 seconds, every 10, ready to go, every 10 seconds, and they still couldn't keep up with the demand. And again, I want you to know, get this down, I want you to know Henry Ford's uh, contribution to the automobile industry. Get this down. You know, his, his contribution to the consumers, he made a car that they could afford. His contribution to the automobile, get this down, he took the old assembly line, write that down. Instead of having a bunch of craftsmen go out and sit around and make one car at a time, he introduced the assembly line, stole that idea from the Industrial Revolution, and he masked, look, all these things, when we first talked about the Industrial Revolution, it seems like a long time ago now, but the mass production of goods, assembly lines, he applied that to the automobile industry, and he made a simple car that most Americans could afford. And it made him a hero among the working class. In fact, get this down, he also, get this down, he also announced right in the middle of all of this that he would pay $5 a day to anyone that came and worked in his factory. And boy, people quit their jobs all over the country and headed for Detroit, headed for Detroit to make that $5 a day, which was an unbelievable sum. But, <coughs> excuse me, but the reason he did that is, you know, there was such a demand for these cars. Uh, he could run, you know, his factories ran 24 hours a day. He could run three eight-hour shifts, okay? They never shut down. I think they might have shut down on Christmas Day to retool them. But other than that, 364 days a year, Henry Ford's automobile plants were going. And I let them off for Thanksgiving, but not much. But he, he could run three eight-hour shifts a day, paying those guys $5. And that sounds good. And get this down. That <coughs> Get this down. That... $5 a day, listen, wage that drew thousands to, to the Ford plants made him the hero of the working class. The hero of the working class said, he's our friend until he, they got into one of those Ford plants. And I'm going to show you tomorrow, one of the, I tend to, they were, 
But I'm going to show you tomorrow one of those Ford plants. The strain was so great. You ought to see how those people are working. It's not like people work today. It's not like when I go to Lowe's and they've got those little blue jackets on, how may I help you? And you say, you turn and say, where's the paint? And they turn around and run like you're a terrorist. Uh, or they're on their phones. Anytime I go there, I always set aside two hours to get somebody to help. But anyway, that's on tape now, so I'll probably be sued by Lowe's Corporation of America. But anyway... It's true. <laughs> I think my chances in court are pretty good. But that's not the way. You know, you know, let me just tell you this. There's a girl that's suing Lowe's. I think it's Lowe's or either Atwood's right now. Suing them or some big company. Suing them now because they hired her. And, uh, you know, she, she uh, wanted them to let her boyfriend. She's a cashier. Where she wanted her, them to let her boyfriend come stand there in the counter with her eight hours uh, and just talk to her. I don't know what that loser was doing, but just talk to her. Uh, and, and the people who know the company said, your boyfriend can't come up here and stand with her. Are you? And so she got mad and quit. So she said she's being harassed or discriminated. And this is an actual case going to court. You know, I hope the judge hits her in the head with the gavel. Not their harm, just pop. You know, maybe some, some, well, maybe some, the brain will go boom, boom, and, and she'll get a little, but anyway. Uh, but this, when you see how these people are working in this little film clip I'm going to show you tomorrow, it's just remarkable. I mean, they just stand there just working as fast as they can for eight hours and get this done. Even though Henry Ford paid five, my whole point is, even though Henry Ford paid $5 a day, which was a phenomenal sum in those days, there were a lot of people working for 50 cents a day, $5 a day, they couldn't stand the strain. And, you know, and after three days, they would quit. To keep a hundred men working, let's show you how bad the strain was, and you'll understand this better tomorrow. To keep a hundred men working in his plant, and women, there are a lot of women, you're going to see a lot of women work there. A hundred men, Henry Ford had to hire a thousand people. He had to hire them, just to keep a hundred on the line, okay? That's how tough, that's how tough it was, okay? Uh, this was a little rougher than answering the phone at the swimming pool, okay? Well, uh, your quiz will uh, go down to, to there, and uh, we will take it up there tomorrow, finish uh, Henry Ford, and go on and finish the 20s.